Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. And here we are, another day, another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to my colleague, um, distant colleague, so to say. Well, we explain further. Hasi Bifanula um, from Bangladesh. And I say colleague because we haven't actually worked together, but we are working on a similar uh, ecosystem of meta science, if you want. So towards equity, looking at different world regions, very engaged in the open science debate at large, publishing specifically. Um, yeah. So welcome, very warm welcome, Steve. It's great having you. Thank you, Joe, for having me. I have been uh, you know, talking about this for some time, so it's really great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Some, some things have a long planning phase, or kind of not even planning, but we we, we committed to do this episode, and then it, take, it just happened, as it sometimes does, that it took a while to actually get to the recording stage, but here we are. So you are a biologist turned development facilitator, as you call yourself or present introduce yourself. And then also a research enthusiast with more than 25 years of working experience. And um, yeah, with that, I want to leave it to you to introduce yourself to our listeners. And then we get to talk about um, one of your latest commentaries, um, which looks at resilience in scholarly publishing. But first, let's hear from you. So how has your career evolved over the years? And what brought you from biology, also what part of biology, like my background is evolutionary and developmental molecular biology, um, and now entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, what's, what's, your, what's your career stages and decision-making points that led to where you are today? Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I of yes, you mentioned it rightly that uh, I am uh, basically a um, biologist by training. Uh, I I started botany at uh, undergrad as well as in my grad level, and I did PhD in aquatic ecology. But what interested me is research communication. When I started publishing my research, I tried to uh, understand and explore what are the other what are the other facets actually of scholarly publishing, not only doing research and getting it out, what are the other avenues out there? That actually brought me to work with uh, Oxford-based charity called uh, INASP, and I started working with them uh, uh, as they work in developing countries all over the world. Uh, and I started writing things as well. Uh, what do we mean by capacity development? What do we mean by inclusion? Uh, all these things that uh, led to me getting involved with uh, the scholarly kitchen, uh, mm -hmm. and we will be talking about one of my articles there. Uh, I still remember it was uh, 2019, and I published my first uh, article as a chef, and it was fascinating because I was the first chef from not from Europe not from the uh, Northern uh, America. So it was amazing that, oh, okay. uh, how I got involved into that. Uh -huh. And uh, that uh, actually helped me to explore things from a different perspective uh, because I'm not a practicing biologist anymore. I work as an independent consultant in the areas of biodiversity, climate change, uh -huh. uh, conservation, uh, and environment in general. So, so you can understand, I have a kind of a kind of a independent consultancy day job kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am also interested in 
uh, research, research communication. That's why I often call myself a research enthusiast. Mm. That's how I came to this particular arena and I have been uh, working in this arena from a personal enthusiasm. And now we are here talking about, you know, uh, probably resilience and other aspects uh, in yeah. scholarly publishing. Thank you, Joe. So the term resilience, I I came across also in, a, in an ecology ecology context first, how earth or e ecosystems are tend to be usually when they are intact, tend to be resilient to climate changes like large scale and small scale, and and that means that they are capable of buffering um crises such as heat waves or floods so that the animals and plants can survive to a larger extent and won't go extinct in that region so not, not everything gets killed and destroyed but resilience in that context means that you can persuade and um, persevere i'm not sure if i'm using the right english words here I'm not a native speaker but <laughs> that you basically have a chance of survival of several species to keep the ecosystem more or less to what it tends to or used to be before the the interference. Now, first of all, please correct me if that's wrong because you're the ecologist and I am just um, an observer thing or enthusiast in that sense because obviously as many of us, if not everyone, um, we care about the planet and therefore run into or follow some of the directions. But what does resilience mean to you and how did you basically then adopt the term to scholarly publishing? Yeah, you uh, thanks Joe for this uh, quick overview on resilience, the way you interpret it or the way you know it. And she's quite right. Uh, it we go by the dictionary definition of resilience, it is essentially something is coming back to the previous state uh, after a disturbance, they simply would. Uh -huh. But since we now uh, in a world where so many different shocks, sudden events, or stresses, a continuous pressure we are all facing. So now resilience has become a new you have to define it more broadly rather than very uh, in a narrow term, as I say, uh, bouncing back. Mm. So now resilience, uh, we often talk about that uh, a system, an individual, an institution, even a country can be resilient if it can survive, as you said, or uh, maintain the essential function despite the fact that there is some trouble around it. Yeah. But it is not only the surviving, it has to go beyond surviving. It has to work in such a way that it uh, coping the present uh, uh, disturbance, but also most importantly, it is transforming itself so that if similar situation happens in the future, it will be able to adapt to it, respond to it, and uh, show, show further resilience. So that's how I see resilience uh, in, in general. Uh, and uh, very simple term, uh, we know that there are certain uh, condition uh, uh, when certain group of people to, to certain diseases, certain group of people, like during COVID, young people, they, are more res they were more resilient than who were uh, much older. Mm -hmm. So this is how you actually show your resilience. Uh, if I now bring it back to bring it to uh, scholarly publishing, since scholarly publishing is a system, sometimes we call it an ecosystem, and many biologists might not like it because <laughs> ecosystem has got a different meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it has to be resilient as well, isn't it? Because there are so many different shocks going on, policy changes. Yeah. Paper mills are uh, uh, affecting us. Predatory journals are affecting the uh, mainstream journals. There are discrepancies in the in the system. We are talking about a lot like uh, 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 APCs. Why why is it is so high? Why it is not affordable to many? Why there are so much pressure on young researchers to publish? Uh, otherwise, they will not get forward. So there are so many things happening as an individual, 
as a journal, as a publisher, we are facing. That's why we need to talk about resilience. That, that's my main argument, why we should bring the resilience concept in scholarly publishing or the scholarly ecosystem as a whole. Back yeah. to you, Joe. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of, of sense. Thanks for explaining the transfer from one concept to another, like from the biological concept of the ecosystem and now then also to individual people, as you brought the example of COVID patients where some are more resilient, that meaning like basically in that sense, they had better immunity. They were better equipped to withstand the viral attacks. And now on a publishing... Yep. In the pu publishing landscape. So when you refer to publishers, there's various kinds. There's those who are kind of dominating, if you may see. I mean, correct me if you see it differently, but I feel most of the discussions we have around publishing is forced upon the community by just a handful, like five to eight publishing houses who, who are going to dominate because they're the strongest on the market they also charge quite significant amounts which then is a big stressor to the scholarly community and academia at large and they argue well without having for us to go into the details we i mean these discussions are being held in various places and fora but um and then there are smaller publishers and institutional publishers so is there a particular group of scholarly publishers who you refer to when you apply the model or scholarly publishing at large, just to clarify? Yeah, uh, you, can, you can think of resilience uh, at different levels. Uh, you made a very important point that if we look into publishers as entities, uh, they, they are quite diverse. Mm -hmm. There are society publishers, uh, uh, I actually joined uh, in Manchester a few weeks back the LPSP conference, and there was a session called, or the panelists were from small pub smaller publishers, or they call it a small publisher. Mm -hmm. And this distinction between large and small, and when I was just uh, calculating how for how many years those the small three publishers were existing in this world, Altogether, these three publishers were contributing or being being present in this world for 500 years. Can you imagine? Wow. But still, we are kind of demeaning them as a small publisher. Wow. So the okay. term is small and large. Large is quite quite uh, quite uh, relative. Yeah. But I would say resilience will. You have to you have to be resilient if you survive for 200 250 years. Indeed, you are resilient. We have seen three pandemics, quite a few, uh, you know, world wars and <clears throat> regional conflicts and everything. You survive. You survive the depression, economic depression, meltdown. So mm. it depends upon. Yes, you may say that larger publishers they have enough resources to survive certain things. Mm. For example, uh, uh. For AI, which is a huge thing, we are talking about it uh, a couple of weeks back. It was peer review week. It was all over the place how to how to use or not use AI or use AI as meticulously. So, if it is a kind of a stress, how to tackle AI? Big publishers they have resources. They can do many things. They can change their policy promptly. What about the smaller? If I use the word smaller or society publishers who do not which have only three or five or six journals only and publishes a, a few hundreds, do they have enough resources to be resilient? Mm -hmm. Here, the resilience means, are you responding to the shock? Are you equipped enough? You have the knowledge, but you, do, you can't actually respond to it because the actual turnover, financial terms is not enough. I can give you two, another example before we move to, uh, to you. Yeah. We talk, we, are, we talk about sustainability a lot nowadays. Yeah. And uh, this month, it will be completion of fourth year. Uh, you may, uh, the audience may know that there is a compact call, SDG Publishers Compact. And it was floated back in 2020 to, uh, uh, at uh, Frankfurt uh, Book Fair. Mm -hmm. And whatever you want to do there, 
smaller publishers, they cannot actually engage a full-time staff to be the sustainability officer. They don't have that kind of resources. On the other hand, we see there's a separate department probably uh, opened for sustainability, environmental sustainability, climate action uh, when you have resources. So you see, to respond to certain changes, uh, money is, is a big issue, no doubt about it. But of course, you have to realize that you need to respond to. Back to you, Joe. Yeah, no, very, very true. I totally agree with, um, and thanks for bringing up these examples and reference points. What I thought of also in terms of resilience is also a necessity to be a readiness for change, right? So resilience basically calls for change readiness yes. when it yes. comes to Indeed. changes have Indeed. like really stressor, stressor um, hitting the status quo. Things will shift to a smaller or larger extent, and then, and resilience means that you, that the person or the institution concerned is ready to shift along to survive to then deal with more salinity in the water of your sessile marine or a sessile limnologic species of a plant or an animal, or, and those who are not capable of dealing with salt in the water, it will simply die. Those who have a capacity to deal with a small shift in the salinity, they will survive. Now, I brought, also when you mentioned well, AI, brought me back to the discussion because the comparison is often made between AI and the internet to occur in the first place and how many of the traditional book publishers who who have established their, I was going to say empires, but who has who have established their companies over also centuries, really, and suddenly, because they were not ready to get onto online selling, they just disappeared within two years. They were bankrupt. Like so sad. But also many German um book publishers. Amazing, amazing example. Yeah. Um okay, now we have AI, so we see how that impacts also the publishing scholarly publishing industry. Anyways, um I'm also about to go to Frankfurt Book Fair, so it'll be interesting to see how conversations unfold there. But coming back to your article now, so resilience and scholarly publishing, you point out in the scholarly kitchen piece, um, there's, was it four uh, categories or four types of resilience? One three. being absorptive. Yeah, three, three, three types. Yeah. Three, sorry. So, or capacities, you call them absorptive, adaptive, which is basically what I just said, right? To be ready for change or ready to go with change, whatever may come. And then transformative capacity, does it imply to actually lead the change or kind of influence change? But please, if you could walk us through those three different, three types of capacity in scholarly publishing resilience. Sure, Joe, yeah. Well, till now, what I have said, it is a kind of a, kind of a fluid way of seeing resilience, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just narrating how I see resilience, but it is often useful to put it in a very simple framework so that we can actually understand uh, how, how it progresses and how it operates. So that's why I used uh, one of the frameworks, which is very much used in development sector. Mm -hmm. By development, I mean development, community development sector. There, when we talk about a uh, community became resilient, what does it mean? Uh, what is how it is responding to the shocks or the stresses or the disturbances? So there are three uh, stages you may call it. It is not like that. It will happen one after another, but it may have it may happen uh, simultaneously within us as a community. So the first thing is you just, on a short term basis, you just need to cope with the disturbance. So you will be just absorbing it. Mm -hmm. It means when there is a shock, there is a problem, you will reduce your exposure to that. So you are prepared in such a way that you are not exposed to that. Or if it happens, you are just coping with that. You are, you are surviving, you are continuing your function. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for example, uh, when uh, uh, last year, early last year, the delisting uh, happened, 50 journals by Clarivet, uh, and there were, uh, you know, Wiley's journals and this and that. So it was a kind of a reputational hazard for uh, Wiley. So what they did, they took immediate decisions over the next couple of weeks to revive their uh, reputation. They stopped publishing uh, some uh, planned uh, spe uh, special issues, this and that. So it shows that that actually tried to uh, overcome the reputational hazard that happened. So this is the kind of a coping mechanism because when you got delisted, you cannot just come back just yeah. then and there. So it is a coping thing. The second one is absorptive. It, we are actually, uh, sorry, uh, adaptive. We are talking about it. Adapting, it means you are, you are thinking a long-term basis. As the example that you gave, when uh, internet or online publishing came, those who couldn't adapt, they just perished, uh, just, just like that. Mm -hmm. But but I would say that, uh, uh, for example, uh, what example I can give, uh, sometimes we see there are certain systems in place which actually help us to absorb certain things. Uh, like I, if I come back to AI, publishers, some actually quite, quite rigid, they started talking about it, AI, and started putting some policies in place rather than ignoring it. Right. It shows that it is adaptive. So Open access, there, there are it... so many different models. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I was we have a slight delay due to the distance, but I yeah, just please. wanted to chime in. Um, it's basically once they realize, okay, change is coming our way, so then they bounce back and then claim and own their change by leading the narrative or joining the narrative as in the correspondence about that change. And then, like you said, they put in place policies to say we're on top of the change. We basically also to give reassurance to the community that it's something to embrace and then discuss along the way. So it also has to do with leadership in a way, in the process, that adaptive capacity. That's a very interesting way to put it, Joe. You, you, you articulated it so nicely that it is not only uh, leading some, yeah, not only joining the flow or movement, but also sometimes leading. Just think about uh, open access for a moment, audience. Mm -hmm. There are so many different ways nowadays we see open access uh, happening. There is diamond open access, not only APC based one, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. There is tra transformative agreement between institution and the publisher, this is another way. Subscribe to open, you know, many big old journals, they are actually thinking of it. So you see, we are trying to adapt to the open access movement in different ways as we feel uh, to bring the finance in. And in certain cases, we become leaders. Some cases we join it, we, we, we uh, further push it to excel it. Uh, so there are different ways. But I, I really like your narrative that uh, it is it is a, it is sometimes it is all about leadership, no doubt about it. Yeah, or basically. What do you do? Becoming yeah, probably also become becoming part of the leading pack. Anyways, okay. So we had adaptive, absorb, absorptive, and now transformative capacity. What's happening here? Exactly. Transformative, as the title says, transformative means we will be transforming ourselves to the core. Very big things to say. Uh, because often we see that uh, it is, uh, although we are in a knowledge communication business, after all, it is a business, isn't it? We cannot make it a kind of a losing concern. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we keep ourselves uh, like, like focusing on economic aspect of the whole venture, but it is more than that. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you think of peer review, it used to be, you know, in, over the last 70 years or so, it evolved a lot. We started talking about uh, double anonymous, uh, single anonymous, even triple anonymous, even editor will not know who is the author. 
mm-hmm. who are the uh, authors. So there are so many. Now we are talking about open, open peer review, community peer review, and conducting peer review at different stages of research, not only at the end, even post-publication peer review. But you cannot say it, it is just some, some diversity and uh, we, are, we are just having our own argument. It is nothing right or wrong. That is not the issue. The issue is where we are going forward. Maybe at the end, if we are talking about once again, uh, AI dependent peer review system, of course, AI will, we might not call them peers because you know they are the reviewers only. So you don't know where we are going, but if we are really going to that direction where uh, uh, AI will be so much appreciated by the publishers that it became part of our workflow, not only workflow, but we are review system uh, stage. That is transformative capacity. Mm. When we talk about over the last four years or so, since the 2020, we are talking about a lot, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, isn't it? Uh, we used to talk about it, but now the momentum has been gained. But how publishers adopting and mainstreaming that at each and every stage of the workflow, that matters. That is transformative uh, capacity building. Uh, uh, there are university in, in, please, Joe. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But what I ju- I've just urged to add to what you just said, and I totally agree here as well, is... Um, it's so important to watch our steps, especially when it comes to equity or like with publishing, scholarly publishing, and then any ambitions to improve equity and working towards justice and how inclusiveness of editors or reviewers or also authors um, to be invited and um, recruited for editorial um, work at certain publishers is so crucial and needs to be done really carefully, not to, yeah. But then also, and I mean, obviously, there's also room for different ways of, I mean, as long as it's respectful. I just see a, a few developments that, I, um, that I'm a bit concerned about where it might end up more, of tokenism and lip service or the difference from lip service to tokenism to real equity and inclusiveness. And that's a blurry line to work really, or it's a very kind of slippery slope in a way. And one can easily lead to the other. But um, so therefore I think as much as of course we appreciate the efforts being made currently and that equity is in everyone's mouth now in every conversation, it seems like maybe where we um are busy, you and I and some of the listeners. Um, but certainly there is a push for more equity, and that's that's good and important important as much as Let's watch out for supporting each other in the best way possible to actually listen and see how the people concerned want to shape publishing and then transform publishing towards equity. Just wanted to add that because you triggered a... Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't agree more, Joe. You have, you have a hit to the right spot there because sometimes we do feel that we are just going with the flow rather than actually embracing the underlying philosophy behind uh, equity, inclusion, accessibility, diversity, isn't it? And I fully agree with you that sometimes, and there are so many different levels. So transformative capacity, if I bring that uh, point again, that often we say that uh, uh, certain level or certain, uh, what do you call it, certain uh, arena we have discussed about equity, but sometimes we often forget about the geographical inequity. Sometimes we are so bogged down with our own understanding or own narrative. Sometimes we do not contextualize equity. For example, very quickly, I I wrote a piece a few years back. I all of a sudden I realized we are talking about uh, reducing north and south, global north, global south divide, and bring us together. Then I said it has to be meeting in at the middle. 
it is not the global not saying, hey, global south, join us. No, 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 it can't right. be like that, isn't it? Because we yeah. have our own realities, you know? Sure. So, yeah. so I started talking about it. I started talking about it. Even I started questioning, Joe, that does the global south wants to join? You know, you're, you're calling us, but I, if I'm, if I'm content, what I'm doing, the way I'm doing, how can you convince me the way I'm doing is not right? It is not a part of diverse way of doing things. Sure. So I'm not saying that I'm doing something illegal, immoral, unethical. No, no, no. I'm not compromising with the integrity here. I'm mm -hmm. talking about understanding the context. If we started understanding the context of our partners, of our uh, stakeholders, that is also part of transformative capacity, I would say. Yeah. Uh, that's why there are some universities uh, who actually abandoned impact factor of journals as an assessment criteria. It is totally un uh, unfathomable for us, some of us. Mm -hmm. But they started doing that because it is overburdening their colleagues, their uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the way of thinking, the defining the way we should be doing things, not just following the status quo. When we move away from them, I can just give only one example before I close transformative capacity. Mm -hmm. I would challenge the publishers, if anyone is listening, if you have, AP, if you are asking for APCs, definitely, of course, for due reason, otherwise it will be a philanthropic venture to publish a journal. Can you be bold enough to disclose publicly how you calculate your APCs, keeping in mind showing the profit margin even, that would be a transformative change that we can expect. Otherwise, one publisher with 2,000 journals, one journal's APC is $200, another journal's APC is $12,000. Mm. How is it possible? How can you maintain quality? Is it all about brand? So disclosing these things publicly is part of your, your transparency, your accountability, and uh, um, shows transformative capacity as well, showing resilience. Mm. Over to you, Joe. Thanks so much. Um, wow, okay. A lot of uh, food for thought, let's put it that way. Like my, my mind is a bit... Um, I wouldn't call it confused. It's um, it's intrigued in many ways in many directions. Uh, I have prepared a couple of questions, many of which we actually already tackled, uh, yeah, tackled and and addressed in the conversation so far. But um, now that we defined those three um, types of capacity and scholarly publishing, how would you? Basically, how would you see what what the most significant challenges and stressors currently are for scholarly publishing? We mentioned obviously AI, paper mills, the peer review, which I think I'm answering my own questions here, but please add to them. Like I've had several conversations as on this podcast series already where we discussed we're publishing so much is doesn't make sense for us to start with. Like the publication pressure is so high. Um, so that we need AI to make sense thereof. And then we need um, fair data and partially open data to even verify that the claims made in the research article is actually true. Um, and then applicable to other societal sectors to actually serve societies in the first place. But uh, so we have a, I, I can already list like three main challenges. What are your... <laughs> Um, I wouldn't call them favorite challenges, but what 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 challenges <laughs> do, you, do you see are basically the biggest stressors? Priorities. I mean, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, Joe. Uh, I think you have uh, identified quite a few, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure uh, everybody uh, has their own list. Uh, but to me, since I I often think of uh, equity in publishing. And since we have just, uh, uh, if I may use the word, celebrated the peer review week, sometimes I wonder why, why we are 
uh, talking about peer review so much. It, it is not only about the week. Uh, I see it a kind of a depressing thing, peer review, I'm sorry to say. Definitely, uh, it is quite important, no doubt about it, I fully ag agree. But the way we use peer reviewers, it became a kind of a, uh, you know, uh, not cheap labor even, you know, free labor, we are using them. And as an editor, I have been facing so much pressure not getting people uh, accepted my uh, request to review a paper. Yeah. It As an author, I also facing the same problem. My editors are saying, I have sent your manuscript to 10 people. Nobody is accepting it. So it seems like people are overburdened. Mm -hmm. It actually happened in a journal where author, I'm an editor in, on, a, on a few journals. When I offered, I, I requested one of the recently published author, they refused to review the paper. Okay. Although they published in the same journal. So if we say that it is a kind of a, a good karma, you do it as a voluntary basis for the for your discipline, someone else will be doing your manuscript when it is ready. So mm. it's a kind of an exchange in that way. No, it is not happening. When you publish a three million, a four million papers per 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 year, you know, you you, you do not have enough uh, peer reviewer, enthusiast peer reviewers. So how how to move away from that? That is one of the big crises, no doubt about it. And we have to be resilient. That's why uh, the EdTage they organized a session. There, I, 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 I envision a world which will be dominated or exclusively 100% dominated by AI. That we human being started coming back to do peer review because we value it. Now mm -hmm. we are not valuing it. So we actually removed the human aspect of peer review. You may say, hey. Women are doing it. No, no, no. Women are doing it, but the value is not there. So I think having human value in in all the stages. Now the authors have become the you know just just uh, paper producers. They yeah. are they are in so much in pressure. We are not valuing them as a human being. And uh, also maybe it's a very expertise. big big things to say. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah. Along with the expertise. The expertise. Yeah. 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 The table to take assessment. I yeah, I get your point. Huh. Yeah. So I think uh, if you ask me that what is the biggest challenge, I would only say this: okay. we are kind of losing the human face in scholarly publishing. Well, I have said that. Hmm. So we have to bring the human face in the scholarly publishing. It is not only papers, it is not only numbers, it is not only index, indices, scores. No, this is human being in the back for in the, throughout the process. And you made very briefly a right point. It has to be used for human being as well. Yeah. Nobody talks about the impact on the ground. We talk about the impact factor. Mm. We talk about age index. We don't talk about how it is changing the lives of human being on the ground through the research I have been doing. Who will ask that question? Over to you, Joe. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, it's sad, but beautifully said. Um, I agree. Like we, we miss, yeah, we, yeah, we lost scope of, of the human factor in, in scholarly writing, reading and publishing, well, publishing part, particularly and to appreciate the labor that goes in when you said like research and research publishing and communication is a human process and when we acquire knowledge using methodology that's tech supported um more or less thereof well social sciences would argue they use less technology compared to engineering and stem and that but it's still human capacity that's driving the process for, again, the beneficiaries are, again, human societies, hopefully also the planet and living species alongside, but um, eventually also to sustain our own livelihood and others. But so, yeah.
I'm like, <laughs> this is why I <laughs> so funny. Yeah. But also, so like I I have these moments and this is why I run the podcast in such conversations and I'm so happy that I can share this now in this format where I actually shift my perspective uh, and you can almost hear how my brain kind of snatches or clicks and then hopefully the listeners will have similar experiences in their own per perception of what we're talking about um, and this is why I call my business access to perspectives yeah. To provide access to different <laughs> people's perspectives and also research disciplines. Exactly. exactly. And like, and that shift is such a, you know, it's also known as Eureka moment. And it might be a small, short conversation, but the shift in the brain is massive because suddenly you see a trivial thing differently. And that gives you a whole other perception of life or that context, whatever. I mean, not whatever, but it's really indeed. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, thank you Joe. For that conversation, I like, it's really, really nice. Um, really, and I want to say all these words, enlightening, and um, but I mean, it sounds like. Uh, anyways, it's. I'm really happy we're having this conversation. Let's put it that way. So. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Peer review is certainly widely debated, but then, as you said, you started your argument with we talk too much about it, and also too much in a in a wrong way. So if we just appreciate for what it is, and incentivize peer review in such a way that it's actually seen and rewarded as scholarly knowledge production, because the the process itself is exactly that people who have experience and professional knowledge on a certain aspect of the research findings that one team presents and others have insight of have a conversation and that's peer review and then hopefully it goes both ways that exactly. comment and then comment back and also make your case as an author if the review is missing a point or brings good arguments but not in the context that the authors present so the reviewers is not necessarily knowing it all they have their own perspective on the work presented yeah we could have like a week-long conversation about peer review alone <laughs> uh, <laughs> to see yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's the beauty of it yeah, yeah. okay so maybe to conclude with another big question to ask you um, based on your experience, how I think technology we already talked about, like AI and whatnot, or but basically, what's your personal take on AI in publishing? Do you see it more of a threat or as a supporting mechanism and needed mechanism where we are currently? Yeah, I, I think. Uh... Last year was a kind of, a, what to call it, a, a year of confusion that where things are going. Uh, that's why you may have seen that there are certain texts uh, in author's guideline or peer review guideline or AI policy that there is a kind of a rigidity. I think we saw similar kind of thing in a scholarly publishing, non, not physical science, but uh, biological science when peer review became quite dominant during COVID, isn't it? Mm. But now you see that uh, big publisher journals, they are actually bringing, sorry, preprints, preprints into their workflow, isn't it? Mm. Now it is nothing, oh no, preprints are not uh, like this and that. You can always cite preprints now, isn't it? No problem. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are different uh, models are already there, the how to make the things uh, peer reviewed so that it can go to different direction and make it more, more, more acceptable. So I think last year was something like that or early this year, something like that with the AI as well. We, 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 were tr we tried to understand. And last year, in September, I wrote a piece in the scholarly kitchen and I... As a, as a novice, I, 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 I dared to write that piece and I, 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 I sh uh, shared my vision with AI. 
uh, especially in peer review. Let us focus on AI here. Uh -huh. I showed five different stages of AI that it has to be from 100% human dependent peer review to 100% AI dependent review system. It has to be like that. That's the journey. Uh, definitely, technologically, there is a huge leap. And uh, this year, there is a just a couple of weeks back, there was an article published in Scholarly Kitchen. And the author said that, uh, uh, Chris from uh, Cactus, that we are already at stage four. Amazing. It mm -hmm. is now we are there where human and AI can work together, at least in peer review arena. Mm -hmm. So I think we have started to realize its potential, but, but where to guide it and how to guide it, how it will help us to make things more equitable, mm -hmm. uh, how even probably, you never know, uh, Joe, maybe we will start arguing what do we mean by a journal article? What do we mean by journal even? Do we really need journals? Or we just need to communicate like through some servers? So I think gradually, uh, whether we like it or not, the way we define our scholarly communication, it will change. The journal-based one will change totally. Uh, if we are taking help to analyze data, from AI, uh, no, taking help from AI to analyze data, to write our articles, to peer review, to do certain things, to publish even, to gather the uh, impact of journal articles even. Um, maybe the question I have raised, whether it is making real impact on the ground, AI will help us to measure that even. So the, the way we think, it will evolve. So that is my take on AI. And it will not take one decade, even even maybe less than five years, probably the way things are moving. Uh, and uh, now the question is whether we are ready to embrace it. Mm -hmm. uh, but and when we will be embracing it? Are will we be missing the bus, or we will be uh, uh, at the bus stand uh, on time? Mm. Yeah. I think you. it's interesting because also today in the radio here in Berlin they. They had a conversation about and quest like asking the public or the listeners of that station um, what they think if or, or one made a claim that technology reduces human capacity, cognitive capacity. And we call can all observe it uh, on ourselves to the extent like I definitely have lost capacity to navigate my way around um, when driving or walking through the city. Because I used to, like traditionally, we use cues to remember where we have to go left or right, or we have to turn um, left or right with a car or on the train or whatever. Now we rely on, let's not mention names, but navigation. Yeah. 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 Um, so AI, that's already AI. We've been grown used to it over the past Ooh. five or 10 years. And I'm, I surely could relearn how to read kind of paper maps and how to use cues again, but it would take be an extra effort. And then there were a couple of other examples, especially like now typing. And there are studies, there's scientific evidence that if you use handwriting, uh, you memorize yeah. better. And I keep telling this in my courses and workshops, like please take handwritten notes to whatever's being said oh. here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I myself, I, I do that sometimes, but only to a minimum extent because I also am pressured for time and I think, oh, I don't have time for this. But then I lose a lot of information along the way because it's only in short term memory. So that also, other to not even handwrite enough anymore. My handwriting is horrible. It's not beautiful. <laughs> but then my aunt, who's, uh, um, he's she's into humanities and literature research and whatnot, and she cultivates handwriting and she writes the most beautiful birthday cards and whatnot. And I always think, oh, I should practice. Wow. So, so it's also <laughs> that human aspect again to have handwritten or hand drawn kind of things to give away, but also 
cognitive capacity diminishes and you can measure it. And that's really sad. So when you say the publishing system changes and uses an increasing amount of technology and not every publisher might be capable or have the capacity to adopt technology because it's just simply too expensive because they don't have servers in house or even in the country, in some countries. <laughs> um, so what happens to them? Will they just diminish or will they just keep going as they used to because it's the only way they know? And um, But then more importantly, what if we rely too much on technology and then we have a power cut nationwide in Western countries? Not so unlikely to happen, really. We've, we've seen it. I mean, not countrywide, but, you know, yeah. we're shut down for maybe not a day, but a couple of hours. So that can happen. And are we then still capable to do it the old way? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I, think... I, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. But Joe, that things things are moving in such a way that uh, it, it sometimes, yeah, you can ignore it, but it is totally your choice. I mean, uh, but to, I do, quickly, I, I'd like to answer your other question that what will happen to the small publishers if they cannot embrace those changes, those, then my question will be that during COVID, we have seen how publishers actually helping each other yeah. by transferring the uh, manuscript as well as uh, yeah. uh, using a reviewer pool to publish uh, COVID paper quickly. So we saw the collaboration. They are competitors, but they are also collaborators. Mm. Then then I would, I would give the responsibility to the associations of publishers. What do they do? Are they there to just develop some tools only? Why cannot they actually test facilitate the process where big publishers who are the who are the members can actually help share certain technologies to certain level at least yeah. and they actually uh, help each other to take the industry forward sure. take the discipline forward same discipline there are 50 journals 20 published by but 30 published by one publisher 20 by another uh, 20 publishers why don't they collaborate so when we are talking about collaboration, why we are only talking about soft type of collaboration, collaborate on sustainability, let yeah. us be a signatory of that action, this movement. No, no, no. The, it has to be more than that, sharing technologies, sharing platforms. Yeah. So probably. otherwise, we cannot have uh, inclusion diversity. Publishers, they are not actually including themselves in the process. We are talking about making editorial board inclusive. What about, you know, publishers, they become entities of uh, inclusion, you know what I mean? So I think we have to be at that stage, Joe, otherwise it will be really, really troublesome to mm -hmm. handle the technological advancement. Very, very troublesome. Yeah. What do you Perfect. Yeah, perfectly put. Um, and inter interestingly, you led to my last question and already answered it. Which would have been, or let me just ask the question and then, you know, whoever missed what you just said, you can just rewind and, and listen again. But the question was, what role do collaboration and community play in fostering resilience among researchers, publishers, oh, yeah. and institutions, particularly in times of uncertainty and or change? So there you have it. <laughs> so now <laughs> for the first time in this podcast series, we're answering before we ask the question. No. Yeah, <laughs> I'm even confused about saying that out loud, but um, thanks so much. This was really informative again, like many episodes before. And I really enjoyed this, especially, um, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for uh, inviting me. I it, uh, it has been a great pleasure to talking with you and uh, the questions and you, you you also shared your own insights uh, and uh, that those resonates with mine as well. So thank you very much, and I hope the audience will uh, enjoy this another episode of uh, the podcast and you know ac get access to different perspectives. You know, I'm sure they will. Yeah, please let us know what you think of these conversations and others, and all the best. And let's meet online soon, maybe at another conference. This year, probably, well, there's a few coming, but more likely next year, I suppose. 
See you around. Okay. Bye for now. Take care. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.